Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today, we will hear Main Street after COVID lessons learned on design and land use. For your content questions related to the presentation, just type those in that Q&A box there, uh, probably maybe at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little Q&A um, with, with the little bubbles and you can just type your questions in as you think of them. We'll answer them at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. If you have any technical questions, I will also keep an eye on the Q&A box and do my best to answer any of those types of questions. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2023. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we're sponsored by the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association. So thanks as always for joining us and for hosting today's session. Uh, we do have webcasts booked out in April, uh, be sure to head over to our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast to register for all of our upcoming sessions. Today's session is worth 1.5 CM credits. To log those, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found again on our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. If you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook. Just search Planning Webcast Series and we'll pop up. That's where I post any important date or time changes. I post when new sessions are available for you to register for. And I post what's on tap for our weekly webcast. We record all of our sessions and we post them onto our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe. Head over to YouTube and just type in planning webcast series will pop up uh, and you will see that we have well over 400 of our series recordings. So be sure to subscribe so that you get notified when new sessions are available for you to register or I'm sorry for when new sessions are uh, posted up onto our site for you to view. Again, if you have any questions for our panelists today, just type those in that Q&A box. We'll get to them at the end during the Q&A. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jeff, to kick things off. Great. Thanks, Christine. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have a presentation on some of the research that Shayla and I have been doing um, related to um, work for small downtowns in particular um, in terms of what we've learned from COVID-19, how to adapt from what we've learned and to develop strategic plans going forward. Um, I am a faculty member at MIT's Urban Studies and Planning Program where I teach economic development, public finance. Um, I run some practicum um, client-based courses and um, I'm also a member of the Northern New England Chapters Board. Um, Northern New England APA is a little bit unusual. We have actually three subsections. So we have about 550 members and they're divided evenly between three state subchapters or sections, um, each of which have about 150 members. And then we have about 50 other members from around the country. Um, we seem to attract a lot of people from around the country who are interested in Northern New England. So that's great. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, Main Street after COVID-19, as I mentioned, and Shayla's gonna present a toolkit he's been working on um, as, as part of his work um, that really helps provide some visual images and some ideas for things you can do um, as you start to move forward towards a longer term strategy um, and perhaps want to try things out or don't have a lot of money. Next slide, Taylor. Next slide. So this started with a study that we did actually in 2020. We got a C grant um, in the first summer of the pandemic from MIT to look at um, basically downtown recoveries after COVID with the presumption at the time that the pandemic would end at some point and what could we do to help um, these small downtowns sort of um, learn and, and thrive and do even better. So um, we decided to focus on six small Northeastern um, cities. Um, we decided to focus on the Northeast, mostly just to try to control for some of the geographic variation around the country. Um, and, but we picked cities that were roughly 100,000 in size. Um, given that though, we chose cities intentionally that had um, a different, different demographics. So as you can see from this chart, um, the median incomes range from a high of 70, 73,000 in Natural New Hampshire um, to a low, I think the lowest one is Youngstown, Ohio at 26,951. 
Um, so certainly a wide range of, of median household incomes. Um, and then obviously, if you dig deeper, even within these communities, there's even more variation. Similarly, looking at the, the percent um, minority, um, again, that varies widely. I think the lowest percent non-white is in Portland, Maine at 18%. Um, and the highest, I think, was Flint, Michigan at 63%. So we tried to control for some of the physical aspects to make sure they were somewhat similar, but we wanted to make sure we got um, a lot of different types of communities in the mix. And really the goal was to look at what downtown businesses and downtown um, interest groups and communities and municipal governments can do to thrive, not just in the short term, which was really a lot of the focus of the work at the time, but we were looking more in the long term, the five to 10 year period. What could we learn from um, the things that got tried during COVID and the weaknesses we identified in our business ecosystems and what planning interventions could really work in the, in the longer run. So that was a little, the two things that were a little different about what we did from a lot of the other research you might've seen is focusing on these smaller cities and focusing on the mid to long term. Next slide. So we started out, and this was before Shaler got involved, um, we started out doing some survey work and we reached out to downtown business groups and uh, had them survey the businesses in their downtowns and asked them a bunch of questions and tried to distill those answers based on their initial reactions. Now, keep in mind, this was uh, September or October 2020, so it was pretty early on. Um, but, you know, not surprisingly, the number one thing that the businesses asked for was financial incentives and a financial assistance, and that's not particularly surprising. There was a huge area of what we classified as other changes. Uh, basically, responses were all over the place. So we documented them and tried to categorize them, but they didn't easily fit into one sort of simple category we could put on a graph. And then a lot of interest in looking at the repurposing these street spaces, looking at parklets, um, looking at taking advantage of the limited public realm these communities have um, on their main streets or similar downtown streets, and thinking about maybe how they could be used for things that, that provided more resilience and more economic activity than perhaps street parking um, and two or three lanes of traffic. The other things that we're some interest on that we're continuing to research is code impacts and zoning impacts. Um, and, and I think one of the big ones that Maybe the businesses didn't pick up on, but a lot of uh, people in the planning world have is having more housing downtown and changing it from sort of a nine to five office area to a 24 seven space, acknowledging that number one, there's going to be more remote work. And number two, um, you know, housing doesn't go away the way businesses might in the same way. So it's a good mix. Next slide. So I mentioned generally what we did in this first phase of the study, and uh, basically we came out with five recommendations. Uh, one was to reimagine these downtown uses and repurpose um, as appropriate to really look at um, this limited resource. It's really a resource that we have a public realm and using it appropriately. The second, and this was probably a little more of our sort of technical side than something that businesses called for, but investing in housing downtown. Um, and that also um, might have some affordability benefits. So that's another reason why we, we recommended it. A third one was uh, businesses were very grateful for technical assistance. There was a lot of technical assistance out there, but they said, look, enough with the technical assistance. We need money. We need operating money. We need capital money. So looking at grant programs, perhaps over technical assistance programs, if you have resources to, to provide to businesses. The fourth one, which is maybe the most controversial, was the idea of looking at some sort of rent stabilization or commercial rent relief for downtown businesses. And this could range all the way from sort of the most draconian commercial rent control, which I think is pretty unlikely in most communities, um, to a much sort of milder um, role for the city government or some other stakeholder in looking at um, mediating conflicts between tenants and, uh, and, business and owners, property owners. One of the challenges is uh, that I've noticed in states, for example, that have legalized cannabis is that there's been this huge rush to um, move other businesses out to make way for all of these stores that sell legal cannabis. Um, and there's no way those are all going to stay viable in the long run. But they've really had an impact on the market um, in terms of, you know, with the local businesses that were there for a long time and maybe got booted out for what might be a very short term gain for the property owner. And then they may be stuck with an empty storefront after that again. So even in that situation, one way of doing this sort of stabilization might be to have a cap on the number of cannabis stores in a certain area, not for any Puritan reason, but purely to keep the market relatively stable for those long-term tenants. 
Finally, and this is really what brings us here today, is looking at developing a long-term plan for downtown parking, downtown access, the public realms, and commit to a plan as much as possible that, that isn't one year we'll try this, the next year we'll try this, which I think is what a lot of communities have done, but developing a public realm plan that's strategic, that maybe is incremental, and then try to stick to it as much as possible. That doesn't mean you might not ever change course at all, but to give the businesses and um, landowners and residents and the city a sense of where things are going. So for example, if they're gonna invest in building a parklet space, which can be very expensive given drainage issues and accessibility issues, they wanna know they're gonna be able to use it for more than one year, which is very reasonable. Um, so having community give some certainty as much as possible um, for these public realm investments is really important. And I think between number one and number five, that's a lot of what Shaler's research has been. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Shaler, who's really been instrumental in, in moving this uh, study forward to this current stage. Uh, I think that's my last slide. So take it away, Shaler. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> uh, my name is Shaler Campbell. I'm a graduate student at MIT in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And I have a background in architecture, which I practiced for five years uh, in California before moving out to uh, New England. So as Jeff said, you know, this is really the outgrowth of number one and number five, developing this toolkit for improvements. And one of the ways that we approach this as being different than a traditional downtown or main street vitalization is that strategic sort of um, interim steps of improvement or interim testing steps. And so that ultimately developed into an 82 page toolkit guide, which builds upon the work that was done prior to my engagement, and then building out these different visualizations to really facilitate conversations around, do we have the right program distribution in our downtown? What should we be doing to change that? What kind of toolkit of implementation makes the most sense? Do we start small and go large or do we go large from day one? And then the process and some of the technical details that come into play with that. So I think the big takeaway really here as we're going through this is that this isn't intended to be exactly what you would implement. It's supposed to be strategic and it's highly malleable. And these toolkits and guides can be implemented um, on a small scale or a large scale or mixed and matched. So these are just a couple of sort of spread images from the 82-page the document that we developed. But first, um, before kind of jumping into the toolkit and some of the methods around that, thinking about the recommended design process, knowing that we have this toolkit developed as sort of the way that we expect to implement that, um, the design process is by no means sort of revolutionary. This is probably what a lot of planners are familiar with and having as community engagement, visioning workshops, and so the way that we've designed this design process is that you go in with the visioning workshop and you meet with community members and understand what do we want to do with our, our downtown or our main street, what's missing, what can be improved, sort of pie in the sky, what are some ideas about how we might want to modify that space. And once you have all those ideas out on paper, they've been documented, you start working through sort of a, a documentation of the study area, going out and taking photographs of the areas where you might want to see improvements, where you might want to sketch over and, and come up with some ideas for improvement. And that leads into this ideas charrette, where in this particular example, we're showing sort of sticky notes over these spaces with an idea. And the point for that is that you bring the community together and you're coming up with specific ideas of, oh, we'd like to do this here. This is an area of improvement. Wouldn't it be nice if we did this? And that then becomes an exhibit to facilitate the discussion around which toolkit makes sense. Are we talking about minimal improvements for our downtown? Or are we talking about large full-scale infrastructural improvements that are gonna be more akin to an extra large, say, improvement? So that idea charrette then leads you into this toolkit for design discussion to see which of the four toolkits make the most sense to start continuing that conversation and have as an example. Then, you know, as you'd expect, you have community feedback, you understand from the community, what are their thoughts on this, where are some improvements, areas, uh, that we can change or modify and then going into some site specific refinements so the toolkits you're going to see may look like okay this is one example and you would just implement this the idea with our toolkit is it's a it's a fictitious street that we've developed um, to try to mirror many conditions that we'd expect in a main street or downtown but it's not supposed to be a specific example that you just simply cut and paste um, like some other toolkits where they might say this is exactly what you do on your streetscape so then you do some site um some site specific refinements to really make that contextual for what makes the most sense for the community. And then a typical budgeting process and then project, project implementation. And what you'll see is a bit different from the project implementation standpoint is that you might start off with a small or medium toolkit 
and then you decide this is really successful, we're going to move into a medium or large um, because, you know, it's been really successful and we want to go a little bit more in terms of our investment. So that's sort of the recommended design process that I just kind of wanted to highlight as we start to look at some of the methods and then the toolkit and case studies um, specifically. But before, again, jumping into the toolkit, there's kind of some methods, some things that we wanted to highlight that are really important to keep in mind when looking at the toolkits and thinking about the kind of improvement that you might want to do these strategic developments, cost saving measures, um, and just making sure that you're setting yourself up for success. And the first one is really around does your main street have the right program distribution? And this is a question that you know many main streets might be asking themselves. Do we have enough activity along the full length of our street to draw pedestrians all the way down? I think that's sort of a, a quintessential question in main street and downtown. Do we have a bookended main street where there's activity at either ends and do we have dead zones in the middle? And some of this might be exacerbated by COVID where you have more businesses that have chosen to leave or gone out of business or you're in some kind of transition period where you're seeking to bring people back. But the point being here that there needs to be some kind of visible landmark or activity here between these different points to really draw people throughout as you, as you seek to implement some of the things that are in the toolkit. So this particular diagram is looking at a, a small city block, um, which some towns may have, whereas other towns might have something like this, which is a larger city block where you, you need to have these visible landmarks uh, a bit more spaced out to really create that activity all the way through. And, you know, so the punchline of that is the, oh, what's that? You know, what's this thing down there that I'm intrigued by? And we're showing it as sort of this ominous glowing orb down there at the end of the street. But the idea is that it's something that people might be going to. It could be a sculpture. It could be outdoor space, could be retail or F&B that's bleeding out into the sidewalk. But it's just something that can, in some cases, be achieved through uh, cost effective, uh, inexpensive uh, solutions or more uh, large scale implementations. But really just what are we getting people to go? further down that street. And then the question that we often get is around, well, there's a there's a difference between the public and private ownership. We can't just tell the private businesses to implement this plan on our behalf. And the point here that we wanna drive home is just the continuous engagement, um, involving them in that design process and helping them understand the part that they play in being able to revitalize and bring activity back to the entire main street um, and how there could be some potential subsidization um, of any kind of facade implementations or other sidewalk implementations there uh, that the private might not wanna pay for. And then also environmental responsibility. Um, with this slide, this is maybe a bit more akin to some of the smaller towns where you might have older materials left over from old curbs, old granite curbs, more akin to New England or leftover timber or brick or asphalt. And these materials can be repurposed for some of the toolkits as an inexpensive test to see, do we wanna close off these particular parking stalls? Do we wanna make some benches here or, or, or what have you to kind of reuse these materials to lower your embodied carbon footprint from day one with your implementation and use something that you already have on hand so you don't necessarily need to go through a rigorous uh, budgeting process. And then lastly, um, just thinking about street closure analysis, um, you know, we're not proposing anything that says immediately your main street's going to be closed and we're hoping that that's an outdoor kind of patio space and gathering area that works in some communities. Um, but what we're proposing largely in our toolkits here is looking at closures of side streets. And that really has to be taken under consideration with great care to make sure that that's not something that down the line is going to make the implementation unsuccessful. So you know, I think preaching to the choir with the idea of, you know, making sure you don't close down the wrong streets, but just to ensure that there's a, a street closure analysis that's conducted. And so with that, um, jumping into the, the meat of the presentation here, which is the, the small, medium, large, extra large toolkit. Um, and this is really, again, not intended to be you implement small and that that's all you did. The idea is that you can start with small and then take elements of large that were successful from small and start to implement them. And that this is a strategic iterative development process that we understand with budgets being constrained, you might need to start with something small that's more affordable, easily implemented, um, and then move to something that's larger, extra large down the line as capital budgets can allow for it. So we've developed these toolkits that build upon one another. Uh, you can certainly pick and choose the pieces from the toolkits uh, that make the most sense for your particular municipality. And so with that, starting off with the small toolkit is really most affordable. It's largely temporary and it's easily deployable. Uh, so it's something that can be implemented by the city very easily, um, utilizing affordable materials like paint, traffic delineators, these granite curbs that might be available um, in some municipalities. But 
taking back some of those parking spaces where you know that you're not going to be, uh, you know, adversely affecting um, the livelihood and, you know, the activity of your space by taking away parking, but really building on some more permanent outdoor spaces. And some of this is very similar to what we saw during the pandemic, but, you know, a lot of that was done hastily. Um, and this is really trying to take a more intentional, strategic, long-term uh, position to some of those implementations. So you can see here creating more outdoor spaces. Uh, we know that, you know, traffic delineators obviously don't have the impact resistance necessary with vehicles passing by, but the idea there being that you're creating some kind of a barrier so that people can really start to take over more of those seating in the parking stalls again in a really affordable easily implementable way more outdoor seating where you have green space um, may, using some painting to highlight the the boundaries and the transition threshold into the downtown or main street so people understand they're in an active zone and then um, some more paint there on the doing murals on the ground kind of using that as a way to engage local artists bring more color and vibrancy into the space and that that also clearly delineates it's not for parking it's a space that's meant to be for people to appreciate something or to have that space really be spill over from the adjacent businesses and then the medium toolkit builds upon that so again these are iterative so it's it's taking cues from small and building upon that and adding to it so bringing in more permanent outdoor seating um, barriers bringing in more of the jersey barriers with covers to kind of bookend them also you can see here we've got the the closure of one of the streets that then creates this outdoor space for people to gather and again being strategic with where that might happen so that it is most beneficial to the adjacent businesses doesn't impact loading and servicing for those buildings um, and then bringing in um, some more um, activity into the outdoor park spaces, um, bringing in storefront graphics where you have businesses in transition, where you haven't quite gotten another tenant yet, bringing in more graphics to make the storefronts feel full, use that as an advertising opportunity for the downtown and really drop more people there so that it doesn't feel like you don't have businesses there, that it feels active um, and, and full of, uh, full of potential. Bringing in more of these outdoor lights, murals, and outdoor uh, movie theater element to really try to bring younger families and children into the downtown. So bringing a, a diverse uh, cross section of the population into the downtown. So it's not just for shopping. People are coming there and they're enjoying the space and having fun, having outdoor events. Um, and then you know, you being creative here with some of the barriers that you use to kind of close off some of the streets um, where you have those street closures taking place. And then jumping into the large toolkit, um, again, building on the medium toolkit is starting to get more permanent with the, the reclamation, if you will, of those parking stalls and turning that into an outdoor patio space, bringing in little eddies in the road here where you can have food trucks and just bringing in more activity. Um, again, kind of getting a bit more permanent with some of these elements. It's more transformative. It's a bit more restructured. Um, also getting into some of the building revitalization. How do we improve some of the facades uh, when you have really long single story buildings, how do you break down that visual, um, the, the length of that facade from being so long? How do you provide visual breaks to that in some affordable ways with paints, murals, bringing in other materiality into the space? And then again, you can see there with the, the uh, food truck being brought in, providing permanent space for them so that you don't have traffic clashing issues with bringing in these food trucks into the, the downtown spaces. Creating more activity are there with the parks, bringing in more uh, tabletop sports, things that make sense for the weather and climate. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if it snows, making sure that um, those outdoor spaces or outdoor sports elements can be taken away when it's snowing. Um, also, again, having um, some more of the outdoor movie theaters, some public art, and then working with private owners to try to repurpose some of these empty lots. That might be land that the city doesn't own, doesn't have official purview over. Uh, but you can work with the owners and say, we'd like to just clean it up a bit, put some benches in there. Um, if anything, it draws people to the downtown and increases the value of their land and is a way for you to provide more outdoor spaces that those little pocket parks can be more meaningful instead of an empty lot that um, doesn't have a purpose that benefits the, the community as much. And then also bringing in more bike lanes into the downtown as well as, as part of the large toolkit. And then the extra large toolkit is really looking at fully reimagined. Um, it's an open street. Um, it's more permanent. This is really where you're getting into more of a permanent intervention into the space. You're bringing in, you know, civil and engineering teams to really take on a lot more of this change for the community. And what we've shown here is a, a one lane single direction road that meanders a bit to create a slower pathway so that pedestrians feel comfortable 
moving back and forth across the street to try to create a larger outdoor pedestrian space. Um, and it, again, this may work in some communities, may not work in other communities, just due to the traffic that is um, naturally moving down the main street or downtown road. But you can see here really creating a lot more of that outdoor space on the sidewalk, creating additional rooms, more seating, it creates space for more uh, stormwater retention, which can be a challenge in older town. The older towns that didn't really have stormwater legislation in place when they were developed and their infrastructure is a little bit lacking in that regard. This is an opportunity to improve some of that, bringing more stormwater in, uh, also planting more trees and creating more outdoor space uh, to really have people linger a bit more so that it's not just, I'm coming to go to business A to get the thing that I needed and then I'm going home, that this is an opportunity for people to meander and enjoy and linger in the downtown. You can see here with the more liveliness that's taking place in the downtown murals here that are serving as sort of blade signs as you move down um, the main street. Turning that pocket park into something a little bit more, maybe it's a dog park, maybe it's a small pop-up store for something else, but giving a bit more permanence to the programming of that space and creating the, the sort of two rows here. You've got the people who are moving along at a more intentional pace, they're going from one store to the next, or those who are moving at a more leisurely pace, they came here to read a book, enjoy the ice cream they just purchased, or just talk to some friends that they ran into, but creating sort of these two different lanes to have slow and moderate traffic um, so there's not really this kind of mixing that gets in people's way. And having more outdoor permanent shade structures so that you can have more outdoor activity taking place um, after business meetings, someone might be taking a meeting there or, um, you know, having a large, a larger gathering for families uh, really to be able to utilize those spaces. And so with that, what we ended up doing with the toolkit, realizing that this isn't implemented in one specific place. These are fictitious roads that we created, fictitious streets to kind of implement and show visualizations. The case studies were the opportunity for us to go back to those original towns that were done and studied and surveyed and say, well, which, which toolkit makes the most sense to implement in some of these communities? And what does that look like? And how does that slightly vary from the toolkit themselves where you might have every single piece in a medium toolkit or a large toolkit but in the case studies themselves, we're contextualizing and using the specific elements that make the most sense for those communities within the, uh, within the case studies. So we, we first started off uh, looking at Havery Hill, Massachusetts, looking at a smaller toolkit for them. Um, they have a reasonably lively downtown Main Street, and there's also not as much space to try to take back more area for other things, outdoor seating and otherwise. So trying to be, um, bit more of a, a light touch with some of the work that we're doing here. So additional trees added in, outdoor space here, cleaning up some of the building facades, bringing more activity that kind of shows that people can keep going down the street since there is this big gap where there's a parking area over to the right where you don't have that continuous facade to really draw people down the space. So really, again, more to that kind of small, subtle, light touch implementation here uh, for this, for, for Haverhill. And even more subtle, I think in this image, um, you can see more of the trees, more of the outdoor seating space, a little bit of uh, affordable and expensive implementations of some paint on the sidewalk really to kind of highlight this is the beginning of the downtown and everything continues beyond here. And then Portland, Maine being a little bit more unique looking at um, the connection from Lobstrom and Plaza North, um, kind of taking over some more of the plaza space and really giving some revitalization here, thinking about bringing in the bicycle lane, storefront graphics, bringing in more public art, really making this plaza a bit more programmed. Uh, right now it's very open, but bringing in some more seating, more programming, more things to kind of, again, have people linger and enjoy the space as you build up more facades here where some of these storefronts are currently empty where you can kind of create more energy for more people to join in. And then further down um, south of the previous image, looking at where you've got this convergence of lots of vehicles coming into the parking garage, you have loading, but you have these two plazas that make a lot of sense to try to create into one outdoor space using subtle graphics on the ground to try to slow traffic and make it feel like this is one large space, bringing in more public art, bringing in light installations here on the, the parking structure more trees, it does get pretty warm with the sun beating down in, in this portion here. So bringing in more shade to really um, control the temperature and the, and the climate here, but also again, really trying to just slow down the traffic and make these spaces feel like they're connected together. 
Um, and then looking at an extra large toolkit for uh, Youngstown. So here we we have really good sidewalks and really good bones and really good street trees and development that's that's currently here. But there's a lot of parking spaces that are being underutilized, and that's an opportunity to grow the sidewalk, provide space for more outdoor seating for some of the F and B, bring space for these food trucks to come in, um, bring more trees to cool down the space where there was previously parking. But thinking of doing a larger implementation here, bringing in stormwater management. But with this would have to be a further study around the parking stalls that are being lost and what does that mean for the businesses that are there and how might this outdoor space really benefit them more. And then looking at how the sidewalks get widened at the end of the main street, are the sidewalks widened to provide more space for the businesses, extending the bike lanes, extending islands, bringing in more vegetation, um, and then also bringing in more murals and really just kind of bringing in a bit more color and activity to this space um, where you have pretty wide um, double two-way traffic on each side, taking back some of that for the sidewalk because you just simply don't have the traffic demands that you might've had 40 or 50 years ago. How do we revitalize that space for what the current state is today and the needs of the people? And then also the same extra large toolkit implementation here for Flint, Michigan, but with maybe a bit more of an implementation, more of a transformation here, uh, knowing that there's not much traffic happening down the main street, but there is this iconic look to the brick road that occurs along that main street, but maybe we don't need that much space for traffic. And so this is a, an opportunity to make that be a meandering one way lane where you do have traffic, that's fine. Those people can use that lane, but for the most part, people don't need to be driving down main street and they can be driving on adjacent streets, giving the opportunity for this to really be opened up with um, an exhibit of old cars, paying tribute to Flint's history, bringing in food trucks and other outdoor activity spaces, expanding the existing gardens that are here, really just trying to let this be more of a statement piece um, and expand for the current, you know, the current uses of the space. Again, two-way traffic in a middle idling lane here in, in Flint doesn't necessarily make sense for how many cars and traffic and throughput they're currently experiencing. How do we change that um, for the for today's uses? Looking at another another direction here, bringing in more murals, more stormwater management, and again, this kind of idea of having these cars, whether they're sculptures or car or the actual cars themselves, um, to really pay tribute there to, to Flint's history. And then Lansing, Michigan, looking at a medium tool, medium sized toolkit, um, a bit more uh, a one sided in some sense, only on happening on one side of the street here, where you're keeping the parking needs that you might have, but on this side, using the Jersey barriers to take back some of that space that was probably taken during the pandemic for businesses, but make it more permanent, more intentional, and let that be adjacent to a bike lane and let that be more of a permanent outdoor space for the businesses around. And also try to draw more F&B back to some of these areas that may have lost them during the pandemic or were greatly reduced. More uh, murals, again, that kind of what's that moment drawing people down the space, knowing that the, the downtown is on either side of this large roundabout that aligns with the main capital, just trying to get people to the other side of that because it is a, a rather large, walking distance and threshold kind of barrier to get to the other side. And then looking back here, bringing in um, interesting elements. Uh, you've got a lot of older buildings other opportunities to bring some intrigue, paint, dichro glass or other elements into the facades to try to create more uh, interest around some of these buildings in a more affordable way without really doing a real full facade renovation. Um, and then also highlighting the crosswalks, getting people to go on both sides of the street and having more activity because Lansing has really large wide sidewalks, um, but there's not a lot of activity that warrants those large sidewalks. So how do we start to entice more people to be down there and have more activity within the storefronts? And then looking at uh, Nashua, New Hampshire, uh, looking at a large toolkit case study for them. Um, they have uh, in some cases, two or three lanes on in one direction and then the middle lane as well. Again, not really needing that much kind of traffic today. How do we start to take back some of that space, a bit more of a permanent infrastructural solution to widen the sidewalks where in this particular case, the sidewalks are not very wide. So giving that space back really does give a lot more outdoor breathing space and activity area for those businesses to thrive even more knowing that they have that space to spill over for outdoor seating um, and bringing in more trees and plantings and, and really just expanding that outdoor activity space. And here you can see it even more there with the, the parking or the, the, um, the sidewalks expanded and then the dry aisles reduced pretty significantly. Again, the traffic doesn't warrant it. There would still be opportunities for street parking, um, but you'd wanna be focusing on trying to expand that sidewalk and give some more space 
uh, back to some of those businesses. And so what we also wanted to provide with our toolkit, in addition to the, 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 the kind of small, medium, large toolkit, and then the case studies with some of the implementation details, and we're not gonna show all of them today, but just a couple of the implementation details to, to share so that we can have um, some technical elements mixed in with some of the kind of a la carte choosing between the toolkits themselves. What are some specific implementations if a municipality says, we really like this idea, what does it actually mean for us? So a simple Jersey barrier cover, what does that look like to bring into the community uh, to bookend the Jersey barrier so that it doesn't just look like the simple construction barriers that there's a little bit more intentionality to them. Uh, the parking stall parking uh, painting, um, just some of the uh, performative spec qualities around that. What does that want to be like so that when you do it, you're doing it in a high enough quality way that that's not going to deteriorate over time, that that's going to work for the community. And um, also by engaging um, local artists, really uh, revitalizing that opportunity in the community. And then window graphics, um, just really simple uh, around making sure that those are meeting the needs for the community, that they're not going to be faded over time, that they're highlighting other elements that the community is implementing uh, through the revitalization plan or highlighting other opportunities that people might want to look after. Um, again, just kind of some performative qualities to that. Um, and with that, that is the small, medium, large toolkit and the, the solutions that we developed that we think provide a strategic framework and lens to really be able to facilitate these conversations. Again, not a stamp it and done that this is the solution to be had, that there's um, an opportunity for conversations around what makes sense for the community and how they can start having those conversations with community members and have an iterative process to implementing them. Great, I guess the last thing that I would say, this is a, one of a set of pieces that, that I've been working on with various folks and uh, Shaler is doing another piece right now that he's finishing up looking at housing code issues in terms of providing upper story housing downtown. So again, building on one of the other recommendations. So uh, if you are interested in this series, I think um, Christine put a couple of the links um, in the chat to the initial study and this piece. Um, you can go to my uh, faculty webpage at MIT at busp.mit.edu, I think it's slash Jeff Levine, or you can find me there. Um, and that's where you can keep up on the various publications as, as we finish them. So I also just want to send a personal thanks to Shaler for all this great graphics work. It was really helpful to bring these ideas to life. And I know it wasn't as easy as it looks. So thank you. All right, are we ready to head into some Q&A? Okay, here we go. This was great. I was saying yesterday when we were doing our uh, our tech check that I loved all the graphics. Um, and folks, uh, if you saw in the Q&A, I did answer that you'll be able to get a recording to this um, and copies of the presentation, uh, assuming that Shaler and Jeff are okay with it, we'll get those uh, from them and we'll post them all onto our website, ohioplanning.org. So links to the download and then uh, links to the recording will be available on our website. Okay, uh, let us dive in here. Um, how does this research fit in with a lot of other work that's been done on how to help communities recover from the pandemic? Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. I, I, and we touched on it a little bit in passing, you know, why is this sort of, how does this build on other work that's been done? I think it has a combination of, uh, you know, both thinking long term and suggesting you should establish a long term strategy. Which streets might you want to work with? Does that work in terms of other factors like traffic operations and like other and working with your state DOT? But then you establish a long term vision. It doesn't mean you immediately have the money to make that happen. So how can you start with a small toolkit and look at some of those very inexpensive um, interventions on those specific corridors? Um, and then build your way up over time. Um, so one example that's perhaps the biggest intervention I've seen, at least in 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 uh, the Northeast, is in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I went there about 20 years ago, and they had a street where they had definitely done some what I would call medium interventions. And I was doing some research on that street for a presentation I was giving because I wanted some pictures of them and discovered they'd actually rebuilt the entire street and done it very much in the sort of extra large model. Um, but they they really prioritized that corridor as one they wanted to work on. And 
they did a lot of thinking about how permanent they wanted it to be and how far they wanted to go. Um, so sort of taking the idea that we want to do something with our precious pri public realms, but we want to do it long term. This isn't something we're just going to try out for a few years. And I think a lot of what I've seen so far is things you can do quickly, sort of pilot projects that you can do in a hurry. Um, we're trying to be a little more strategic about this. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> how do you overcome the inevitable comments and concerns in smaller communities that, well, people drive here and we need to keep the streets for cars and for parking? Sure, I'm, and I'm interested in Shaler's thoughts on this too, but I would just say it's, 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 that's always a challenge, um, particularly in places that, you know, these 100,000, 150,000 population communities that do have a fair amount of traffic, maybe fairly auto dependent. But, you know, as Shayla mentioned, in a couple of toolkits are still overbuilt for that. Um, if you look at it from a traffic operations perspective, you don't need all the infrastructure you have. Um, and at some point, it may just require um, having um, political leaders who are willing to try this stuff. So you don't always have total control as a planner. You may need to wait until the policy window opens with a certain city council or a certain mayor or a certain city manager. Um, and maybe in the meantime, we try smaller things that maybe don't have as much impact on traffic flow. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that there's always an aversion to taking away the existing amount of parking. Um, and I think you can do that in smaller steps, like starting off with a small toolkit and taking it away temporarily. And, testing out how does that impact the businesses and maybe we took them away in the wrong spot because that particular business does rely upon a lot of people who drive there. Um, so I think you just have to be iterative in that process and not be dissuaded by, okay, our first, you know, foray into this didn't work. Let's look at it further down the street. So I think it's just about having multiple attempts at that and being flexible about how much you can take away and where you can do it. You also don't always have to close your highest volume street. So if your main street causes a lot of angst, there are side streets um, and they tend to have lower traffic volumes and may work fine. Um, I know this was done in, I think it was in Freeport, Maine. During the pandemic, they closed Main Street um, and it didn't go so well. Um, it was, there was too much space to use and it had real significant traffic issues. So they changed gears and they closed side streets instead. Um, and that, that seems to have been much more successful. Um, does the toolkit I, I don't I think the answer is no because I just kind of briefly went through it. Um, but is there an option um, for the for a future toolkit to kind of explore more about uh, zoning implications and some of the things that we should think about in terms of either overlay districts or zoning amendments or you know we were talking a moment ago about <clears throat> parking. Um, should we be talking about parking minimums or kind of lifting some of um, you know the the details on some text, zoning text. Can you talk sure. a little bit about that? Yeah, this this doesn't touch as much on that. You'll see in the mm -hmm. sort of broad, the initial study, it does touch on this issue a little bit, but it's definitely a topic for another follow-up report, looking at ways of approaching downtown zoning and thinking about it differently than uh, than sort of traditional Euclidean zoning. So that's there's a big topic there. I think the big thing to think of that I would definitely suggest is looking at housing as downtown use and making it as easy as possible to do that. Um, because often the biggest challenge there is often going to be code issues anyways. Um, this next question is, um, how, how do you handle, how do you handle the possibility that some people might, um, deliberately act badly in public spaces, particularly where there's higher volumes of pedestrians? Um, and we're talking about those, it's happened before you know, where people are driving into crowds or motorcycles are going way too fast or, mm -hmm. you know, anything like that, fights, riots, whatever it might be. Um, do we take that into consideration? Do we need to take that into consideration? Would it be useful to have more connections with the local law enforcement groups just in terms of planning out to see if, you know, there's any cooperative work that we could do together to reduce that or, you know, at, at least deter it? You want to take that, Shaler? 
Yeah, I think, um, well, with some of the toolkits that we're looking at where we're talking about bringing more vehicular traffic onto the sidewalk and trying to lower that threshold a little bit, I think we certainly need to be thinking about um, the potential for malicious actors to take advantage of that. Um, and we can achieve that with, you know, implementations of bollards um, and being really strategic about that, having communications with the community about how safe they feel. I think those conversations want to happen during the visioning workshop as well. Are there safety factors that uh, are currently not addressed in the downtown that we want to be improving? And then as you go through the toolkits, making sure that we're not creating an opportunity for some malicious actor to come in and harm people. So I think it's part of the conversation. Um, and I think it's part of the details of the conversation. I don't think it's necessarily the, the seminal part to discuss. It's the it's detail of implementation um, with, with public safety. Yeah, I would just emphasize vertical interventions that are not um you know that that maybe they might damage your car hopefully they wouldn't hurt anybody if they ran into them but you do at some point have to accept the fact you're going to need to put vertical things in the way to keep people from driving where they shouldn't um when we're talking about <clears throat> bringing housing back to the downtown how are we keeping um how are we keeping in mind affordable housing because i, I feel like housing in downtown and then affordable housing don't normally cooperate Sure. And, and I think that dynamic might be a little different in some of these smaller city downtowns. I think in our sample set, the exception might be Portland, where there's a lot of high-end housing being built downtown. But I bet in a number of these other communities, there isn't quite as much demand. And certainly uh, in a lot of city downtowns around the country, there isn't as much sort of demand for high-end housing downtown. I think the one of the things that's interesting is some of the affordable housing programs like the low-income housing tax credit actually make affordable housing more economically feasible than market rate housing because they provide a layer of financing you might not have access to. Um, I did a project in Holyoke, Massachusetts this past fall with a practicum class. And we pretty quickly came to that conclusion that the only way they were gonna get more housing on their, on high street was using things like the low income housing tax credit because the numbers didn't work for market rate housing. So I, I'm not sure it's quite as much of a conflict in many communities in the attractive communities where a lot of people want to be, it is going to be hard because you are seeing a lot of empty nesters who want to be downtown. Um, I guess my only thought would be that's a place where you can look at a regulatory solution like value capture, where you could um, have an inclusionary zoning program or an impact fee, um, depending on how the laws work in your particular state, to capture investment into a housing trust from that high-end housing that can then be used to build affordable housing. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> with your case studies, uh, did you take note about what kind of transit systems they had or what mobility options were available before, you know, I mean, obviously making these types of recommendations, um, but there's a couple questions coming in, I think, related to that. Um, you know, do they have just a simple bus system um, or, you know, do they have more than that? Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of the towns that we looked at largely re relied upon bus systems as their primary uh, public transportation, um, also from the adjacent light rails that they may have. Um, when we were looking at the toolkits, we were, were not necessarily factoring in public transportation as much um, when we were looking at which implementation to put in each town. It was really more of, is the town in need of, or is that particular street in need of a larger implementation like Flint or Youngstown? Or smaller implementations like Haverhill. It wasn't necessarily based around transportation and like a DOT analysis or, you know, um, transportation density. I will add, these can't go hand in glove though. Um, downtown Portland, Maine on, on uh, Congress Street, they implemented a bus priority corridor. And as part of that, they added um, curb extensions to have inline bus stops. Um, so the buses didn't have to pull in and out of traffic. They're looking at traffic signal prioritization um, but this, these wider sidewalks obviously also have um, advantages for other users of the of the street. Um, and that was controversial. There certainly were people complaining, why do I have to wait behind a bus? I didn't just have to wait behind a bus. Um, but it settled down and it does seem to provide better trunk service for their bus system. Um, but thinking about that is, a, is an important part of implementing. I agree. Um, regarding the reduction of on-street parking, I'm sure there's a million and a half studies about this going one way or another. Um, but does eliminating 
on street parking in front of a local business hurt the business? I think it depends a lot on the type of business. Um, you definitely have legacy downtown businesses that are pretty dependent on drawing from a large area in part because more people are buying online. So you may have had what wasn't quite a specialty shop 50 years ago, like a few repair place. And now it is because they just don't have as many of them as they used to. Those sorts of businesses are very dependent on off-street parking. Um, it may not have to be right in front of the business. Um, and then other uses like food and beverage or you know, even other retail uses are much less dependent on it and actually would have a net benefit from the easier acceptability for bicycles and pedestrians that this would provide, the fact that people are going to be hanging around anyways. So it really does depend. Um, I would encourage downtowns to look at their parking supply overall, get a sense of, again, if they can be strategic about it. It doesn't mean you get rid of all your on-street parking, um, or maybe it means you put aside an off-street lot on a side street and back. Um, so that you can save that main street space that's the most attractive for active uses. Uh, this is an interesting question. Thoughts on having public restrooms as opposed to folks just having to use restrooms in individual stores if, if it's even possible. Um, you know, to me, if, if I walked down a main street and I saw public restrooms, I would think to myself, oh, they want me to hang out here. They want me to be here. They want me to you know, sit, relax, enjoy myself. Um, of course, there's a lot of costs involved with that, but what are your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a great study being done right now by the Portland Society for Architecture called Know Your Pea Shed. And it's uh, <laughs> it's it's all about downtown bathrooms. So it's really interesting. It's really come up as a big issue in downtown Portland, Maine. Um, the idea that public bathrooms mean people are welcome to hang around. They don't have right. to spend money the way they do at the mall. Um, so where are those publicly accessible restrooms? And in fact, the city just offered up a piece of land for sale for redevelopment. And as part of the purchase and sale agreement, they wanted funding for four public restrooms. They didn't want the money. They wanted the restrooms built. Um, wow. So this is a huge issue. I think it's a really great question. Um, there's also a lot you can do um, sort of, again, light or experimental with public restrooms. Um, you don't need to build out a fancy, what do they call them, the Portland Loos, those really expensive mm -hmm. Um, great, but really expensive and, and fairly um, big um, facilities. If you have some privacy, you can basically build a something that's a step up from a porta potty, but it's actually a lot more comfortable and is a lot less expensive than something like that. Um, and I know communities have experimented with that a lot during the pandemic, and a lot of those have become permanent. So I think that's a great question and a really important point. There's also something to be said about having more accessible restrooms as a result mm -hmm. of that. Older downtowns, the restrooms in some of the stores might not be fully accessible. Yeah. So people who have disabilities have more restrooms that are available for them. Mm -hmm. So that brings even more people to the downtown. Yeah. Um, so in terms of hanging out downtown, we, you know, we learn in planning 101 um, that you can have a great space, but it needs to be activated in some way. So um, have you thought about or discussed how communities can implement programming in downtowns? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on that? Go ahead. Yeah, we touched on that a little bit with sort of the, some of the green lawn spaced area by having outdoor movie events, um, also bringing sport events out into the into the community. And a lot of that will require programming and someone's gonna to have to dedicate some of their time to doing that. But the great thing about that is that you can get feedback from people right after. You can put up a QR code and say, did you enjoy this? Is this working well? It's a great way to quickly source feedback as a survey from the community. So um, having that be something that's open and can be easily programmed to a number of different things really brings people there and they know that you know, on Fridays, so-and-so is happening on Saturdays, so-and-so is happening. And so it, it also lets the businesses know that they might have a higher influx of traffic when those events are taking place and they can maybe do more things to engage in the sidewalk. So um, we did think about that in some of the, the open green space programming for the toolkits. Um, <clears throat> the changes that, that you've been talking about, what of them, um, what might these sort of changes do to the business mix downtown? Who will be the winners? Who will be the losers? Sure. Um, this is something I've thought about a lot, and there are going to be impacts. I mean, I mentioned earlier, some 
some of the more traditional sort of types of businesses that maybe uh, draw from a larger area are going to be very sensitive to loss of parking. Because if you're a downtown repair shop for watches, people come from all over your metro region to get their watches repaired there. Somebody comes in from the suburbs and can't get parking, they're going to complain. They're not going to, they may not want to come back. Then you have other sorts of businesses, record stores, um, you know, even, uh, even certain types of clothing stores where it's much less dependent on this idea that someone's coming in from the suburbs and wants to park right in front of the business like they're used to in their hometown. So there will be winners and losers. And I, and I, I think that one element of that is it's probably going to happen anyways over time, but you will definitely have those businesses that are concerned about these impacts and will be very vocal about it. Um, and then you'll have other businesses that are pretty happy about it. Um, and, and I don't have an easy answer other than, you know, to some extent you have to weigh the benefit you get from that 360 square feet of space you use for a parking space um, and see what the alternatives are. And then just make a determination on the local level. And you almost have to do it space by space. So, um, but there absolutely will be businesses that will be negatively affected by these sorts of changes. I just find that in most downtowns, the number of beneficiaries way outweigh the number of people who are negatively affected. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that that is compelling to people. Um, let's talk about food service for a moment. Um, here in Northeast Ohio, we have this huge uh, insurgence of coffee huts and <laughs> <laughs> these sort of quick serve uh, type establishments where there is no seating. That's, uh -huh. you know, we're now starting to get the Chipotle's that are, you only order online and you pick up through a drive through or like uh -huh. run into like this little vestibule area. I mean, this, this happened really because of COVID. Yeah. And I, it's here to stay. So we need to be able to take that into account. How do we do that? What What are your thoughts on, on those type of businesses where they might even have had a storefront, you know, they're a restaurant and they're no longer having people dine in. You can only come in and grab your food and leave. What does that do to a downtown mix when, yeah, you know, all, all of that, talk about it. I think it depends a little bit. Um, I think I would start off with the basic, hopefully not too controversial statement that in most downtowns, I don't think that there is a compelling reason to allow most drive throughs um, with the exception potentially of pharmacies, where there's a real public health reason to potentially allow someone who's sick to pick up prescription medication through a drive through um, But particularly food and beverage drive throughs I think have the most impact on the surrounding area. So I guess that's my starting point, which is that although businesses may want them, it's certainly within the police powers of a city or town to not allow them. And particularly in your immediate downtown, I would suggest that they do more in negative impact to the public realm than positive. You're going to end up with a lot of cars traveling through on driveways. Um, you'll end up with more trash, um, just a lot of conflicts. What I do think are really great in downtowns are these walk-up windows. Um, and I've seen those, those took off during COVID too. And those are also there to stay. There's a new bakery in my neighborhood that is basically walk-up only. It has a walk-up window and you basically order through the walk-up window. Um, and I think those are great. I don't have any problem with those at all. It's sort of too bad not to have the indoor site seating, but that's a way that people can get their food order online, come pick up. Um, and the downside is that for some people, you have to get out of your car. But again, if we want to make these downtowns vibrant and active, people are going to have to get out of their cars. Um, I'm going to press on this a little bit further. Um, I'm still seeing a great disservice as I understand you need to get people out. You need to get them walking on the street to activate the street. I get that. Um, but this is the way that it is now. This is what people want. This is what people are now accustomed to, what they're used to. So if they have a choice of running through, you know, a restaurant's drive through six blocks out of downtown or going downtown, they're going to go six blocks out of downtown because it's more convenient. Mm -hmm. So how are we keeping a downtown relevant if we're not providing the services that the people are now accustomed to what they want? Sure. And I guess my response is in 95% plus of America, they can do that. 
Um, these are the 5% areas that do something to offer something different. And I guess I have faith that there's enough people who want that something different to allow that 5% to thrive. If you try to have both, you may get neither. But you still may find people would rather go to the Chipotle on the edge of town than the one downtown, even if it's a little further, because they don't have to deal with the driveway and the people walking on the sidewalk. And, you know, so I guess to some extent, there's plenty of places for those uses. I just don't think it's Main Street. Okay. Um, next question. And I was thinking about this too, actually, when we were talking about the public restrooms, uh, homelessness in downtowns, in the study cities that you looked at, did you take into account uh, any homelessness? Sure. There's a big homelessness issue in Portland, and I know there are in a number of these other communities as well, Nashua, certainly Youngstown and Flint. Um, People experiencing homelessness are a huge range of types of people like everyone else. And uh, in many situations, people experiencing homelessness can add to the vitality of an area. There's always a subpopulation that have challenges. And I think the focus really needs to be on getting them into housing, housing first, providing them the social services they need, um, rather than creating homeless, unfriendly areas like benches that have spikes on them so you can't lie down on them. That that's sort of a last resort that that to me suggests that you you're out of ideas. Um, but homelessness is a real problem in this country and it really comes down to a big problem with housing affordability and our economic systems. And I don't think that uh making your downtown unfriendly has the enough benefit um as versus the cost. Um, and again I would just stick up for the fact that Lots of people who are homeless, you wouldn't know it on a day-to-day -day basis because they're experiencing a tough, a rough spot in their life. Hopefully it will pass. But the stereotype of the homeless individual is 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 not always the actual person experiencing homelessness you meet. Thank you. Um, I'm just zipping through all the, oh man, we have so many good questions. Oh, here we go. Um, did any of the communities that you studied have a certain percentage of vacancy rate uh, in the downtown due to COVID? Sure. So just going back to the initial study, um, they had a range of vacancies. Um, you know, some of those downtowns had very low vacancy rates. Portland and Nashua have very low vacancy rates. Haverhill has a very low vacancy rate. Youngstown, um, when we spoke with them in Flint, much higher vacancy rates. So we did try to look at the range because we knew that not every community was going to have every storefront full or every storefront empty. And a number of the approaches that Shaler suggested can be done without actually having active storefronts. You know, the, uh, the sort of what's this idea of let's put something down the street that's attractive so that you walk through that empty area where maybe the storefronts are, are not active right now, or you put in attractive um, facades inside the windows. You do work with a local printer to print interesting things in the windows so that there's something there that's not just paper that's half falling down. What do you think, Shaler? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that largely. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just did wholesale agree with that. Great. <clears throat> um, to your point about storefronts that aren't currently active, uh, did you come across or have you come across um, any really good or unique ways to temporarily use the space? Um, and I, I'm not talking about, you know, the Halloween USAs. That's sure, sure. not what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, even as spaces for community activities or, I mean, you know, I, I've seen storefronts before where kids will come down and they'll, the third grade class will draw murals in the windows, things like that. But even just to like physically activate the space so that there are feet on the ground, um, you know, during a time of transition. Yeah, a couple of things we looked at, um, we kind of brainstormed through that would be, those could be co-working spaces, people who aren't going into the office, they are working remotely, but maybe don't want to work at home, they want to work in some halfway space, that's an opportunity to use those areas, they could also be an opportunity for um, small businesses that are trying to start out pop ups to have an incubator space to really test out their business model, um, have pop up stores during different times of the year, uh, and that could be a way for the community and the um, the local government to make an investment in some businesses that might be able to then thrive and actually take over the space so that there be trial run efforts 
um, or that could be eating space. That could be sort of a cafeteria space if there's different times of the year, if the outside is not as comfortable, the adjacent businesses like a Chipotle or something that don't have seating could then utilize that space really for people to be able to eat and stay in the downtown. I think the biggest challenge with that will be code because to even occupy a space temporarily, you're going to have to make some code improvements and who's going to pay for that. So that is an honest challenge that I think would need to be wrestled with. Um, thinking again about the things that have come out of COVID or have gotten bigger, um, one of those being delivery vehicles, whether they be your Amazon truck or your Uber Eats, whatever it may be. Um, if we're looking to get more residential units downtown, we need to understand that people are going to be using Amazon and Uber Eats and things like that. So how are we going to um, account for those temporary parking needs? Sure. I, I always think you need to allow for good loading zones. Um, that's a place where, again, you think about the number of square feet you're using up and what you're using it for. If you have a loading zone that's used by three or four storefronts, that's probably a good use of that space. So I'm not I'm not anti-loading zone at all. I think we do need to factor that in. I do think there's a bigger question that's beyond even just downtowns, which is as we procure larger and larger public safety vehicles, we end up having to design our downtowns around them. And I think that is a challenge that's bigger than this particular study. Um, and at some point you do have to, to think of maybe you have an area where you have mountable curbs for fire trucks, but normal vehicles wouldn't want to do it. I've seen that at least in roundabouts, and maybe you do that for those sharp corners that you might have in your downtown. Um, but that's a challenge as well. Um, but definitely loading zones and handicap parking are not part of, you know, what I think of when I think of using a parking space and having potentially limited benefit as a result. Yeah, I think those are some those are some of the finer details of some of the toolkits we've been proposing as well. Like if you think about the extra large toolkit, um, having roll curbs to allow for vehicles to be able to pull off and make their deliveries, having designated spaces so that no one is stopping in the road and then, you know, throwing a wrench in the traffic. Um, and then as well, the kind of accessibility parking we didn't illustrate in our diagrams, but that's definitely something that is the finer details of implementation. Um, let's jump back into housing again. Uh, do we know of any studies that indicate how, how many units of um, housing we need in order to kind of create that vibrant downtown? <laughs> like, is there some kind of minimum that we need to be shooting for? I'm not aware of a general sort of guideline. I know that there have been housing market studies that look at what you might try to get in a specific situation. But I think it's fair to say that most downtowns have less housing than they ideally should. So if that vector points you in a certain direction, so be it. Um, and just allowing it doesn't mean you're going to wave a wand and it's all going to be there. As Shayla's other memo um, explains, there's a number of issues with building housing downtown. It's not going to happen overnight. So if you find that, uh, that you're overshooting it, you certainly have, to, you're not, it's not like you're gonna change your zoning and allow housing and a year later, that's gonna be entirely built out. It's gonna take years for that to happen. But I don't think there's any back of the envelope number other than you know potentially looking at market studies and saying we want a certain amount of disposable income within a certain distance of our downtown to keep a certain number of storefronts operating. Um, and in order to attract housing downtown and people to want to be in that housing, we need to be offering amenities and services that are that are really close, like your pharmacies, your grocery stores, banks, things like that. So I, I feel like sort of simultaneously as you're trying to encourage developers to come in um, and put some housing in, you also need to be you need to be prepared to attract all those people to the space. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Was was there any work done in kind of cataloging in, in your study areas the, the amenities that were available that would then encourage housing downtown? There is a little bit of a chicken and egg there. Um, you know, I think right. once, you, once you have the housing, um, capitalism is an amazing thing. People will start businesses that actually serve that housing. Um, if you want, the question of whether you need to jumpstart it with a certain amount of um, amenities first. Um, I think that the government doesn't generally control 
businesses, what businesses go into storefronts, it can create the context whereby people want to be there. And the analogy that I'll make is, you know, you, you don't, you're not actually the food that's grown, but you can create the soil that allows that food to grow. And that's sort of what we focused on was how can we make an attractive environment where businesses might want to be? And then maybe they make the leap and then maybe the housing follows because, hey, there's a couple of great restaurants downtown. Wouldn't it be fun to live near them? Um, kind of to that, in your study areas, did any of those communities already have a certain type of code for their downtown that was <clears throat> a little more forgiving, I guess? So like a form-based code, did any of those communities already have that established where it was more um, about not so much what it is, but just as long as the space um, is goes well together, but not so much the uses? Sure. There are a number of codes that are very lenient on parking downtown um, that basically don't require, I know Portland's downtown zone doesn't require any parking downtown essentially. Um, mm -hmm. What it does have that sometimes, that I have mixed feelings about is it has things about minimum heights, for example. And I worry about that a little bit. I get the idea that if you want your form, you ideally want you know multi-story buildings on your main street. But I do worry that it doesn't allow the incrementalism you may need to have to help a more struggling downtown do well. So, um, you know, I, I think there are certain strategic things you need to do in your downtown zoning, but there's definitely a lot of things that you need to pull back on from where most communities are. But we didn't do any systematic analysis of the six okay. communities, no. Okay. Um, in in terms of encouraging businesses to come back into downtowns, um, I'm trying to figure out how I want to frame this. Um, in in any of your the communities that you studied, did you gather any information from um, building owners, landlords about rents? Um, you know, uh, are they still charging a premium uh, or are they, you know, kind of getting people in the door and then the rents are skyrocketing? Um, what have you learned from, from your case studies about that? Yeah, I think this was mostly done in the initial surveys where rents were highlighted. And I mentioned one of the recommendations was to figure out a way to try to help with, you know, maybe not a, maybe not a command and control rent control for commercial spaces, but be aware of the fact that they're very sensitive to the rents that are charged and that property owners are understandably interested in getting more rent than they're getting right now most of the time. So I think it's a real challenge for a lot of these businesses, particularly the ones that are maybe a little more funky or unusual, that maybe are trying something different um, and are trying to compete with the formula-based business that can pay the rent and knows they're going to bring in the customers and aren't necessarily a bad part of downtown. I don't have any problem with a pharmacy downtown or, you know, a, a clothing store. But, you know, I think the rent continues to be a challenge for a lot of the smaller businesses. The one thing that I would suggest to communities is to think about ways to get successful sort of in, unique local businesses downtown. If they ever have an opportunity to buy the building they're in, they should do whatever they can to make sure that happens. Even if it means they're suddenly in the business of renting out apartments or subletting other storefronts, because that's the truest form of commercial rent control is to own your own building. That's about as good as it's going to get. Thank you. This is a good question. And I'm thinking of several main streets around here where this applies. Can you address complications that arise when a main street is a state highway and oh, managed sure. by, by a DOT? Sure. Shayla, so, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I mean, when Jeff and I started looking at these studies, there was an, an example he referenced to me where they shut down their main street and it was not necessarily a highway, but a high throughput road. And that then really killed the idea for them and the businesses struggled. So I think from a jurisdictional standpoint, um, it's going to be challenging, obviously, to do anything. Um, I have heard examples of where uh, the local government will give control and maintenance of the road over to the local municipality for particular sections that are highly relevant to their economic development. So you can look at opportunities like that. Obviously, it's going to be a long term engagement with them um, to get their approval on what needs to be done or what you think needs to be done um, to improve those communities. So that will certainly prolong the, uh, the process of implementing any one of the tools. And it might mean that you really need to look at small or medium and you can never get to extra large because of the overlap of jurisdictions. 
it's also a situation where you might look at at making changes to other streets downtown. Maybe it's not your main street. Maybe it's the side streets off it. Maybe it's a street one block over. It's not doesn't have state highway control. And then finally, you know, I not it certainly isn't true for all state DOTs, but a number of them have have gotten on board with this sort of stuff and are much more willing to talk than maybe they would have been 10 or 20 years ago about being creative with these sorts of things. Um, this question, what elements of your toolkits do you feel particularly respond to the post-COVID environment? For example, what might be related to remote work trends? Yeah, I think part of that was really trying to create some of these outdoor spaces where people have more modalities to work um, and people can actually go and work in downtown and have more vibrancy, where if maybe you don't have enough housing now to create that vibrancy, if people are coming and working in downtown, mm -hmm. or it's a, it's a destination for them to be able to go and spend more of their, they take a two hour break in the middle of the day, it's a destination that they want to go to. Um, it was really about getting people to go there and have that kind of co-working element, I think is really the strongest response to post-COVID and the change in work modalities. Yeah. ARPA funds, can we use them for some of this? Where, when, how, what are your experiences? Um, I think the short answer is yes, but um, it depends a little bit on the source of funding. Um, and, you know, I, it would be hard to get more specific than that, you know, generally. Yes, I think there are opportunities to use ARPA funds for a number of things that are from the initial study, um, but it really depends on the specific source of funding and how your community or your county or your state have prioritized spending it. Um, back over into housing. Uh, the question is, in my circumstance, our biggest challenge is attracting residential development. In your experience, what's more helpful? Implementing the kinds of build it and they will come infrastructure and streetscapes that, that you've mentioned, or uh, providing development subsidies and grants directly to the developer, or both, sure, or neither. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think the short answer is both are helpful. I know you might have limited resources. So you may have to make sort of strategic decisions. Um, I tend to feel that with the exception of permanently affordable housing, where there you are able to tap into resources that maybe can't be used for other things, um, creating the context that's attractive for developers is probably a better investment in the long run than directly subsidizing developments. So if you can, if you have a choice between doing a TIF credit enhancement agreement with a housing developer or taking that TIF and using the money to redo downtown Main Street in a way that's more attractive, I'd suggest that in the long run, the second one's a better use of those funds um, in most cases. And there are always exceptions, but you know, but then if you have dedicated sources like home or um, low income housing tax credits, you know, obviously those can only be used for housing and can really make a difference. Yeah, there's also something to be said about the kind of empty chair and decanting spaces as you start to build more multifamily housing with retail on the ground floor too. If you have to displace someone, you have to have empty spaces to be able to move storefronts around. And so that does in some sense need to be built first. And that's something that Jeff and I touched upon in our other memo that looks at housing is that there's the challenges of moving single story retail into new multifamily retail or multifamily housing with retail and kind of moving those empty chairs around as it's built. So that's another consideration where you do kind of have to build it and they will come because you have to be forecasting that. Um, this is interesting and it kind of goes back to uh, our discussion about activating the space. Um, it says Portsmouth, New Hampshire started a food oriented waterfront festival program several decades ago, which mm. triggered substantial restaurant developments. <laughs> so in your experience, do you, like, is this a one off or does this is this one way to really activate and uh, jumpstart uh, struggling downtowns in terms of, you know, creating these festivals, social events to, to get people down there? I think they're a great start. Um, you know, I've seen them in downtowns that uh, I've seen them in the long run help launch sort of more bricks and mortar businesses from a short term base. One thing that, uh, you know, one thing that I think um, communities could look at investing in downtown is some sort of incubator commercial kitchen space where, you know, food trucks and small pop ups could share space to prepare food and share that cost. 
And then eventually maybe they open their own sort of kitchen when they open an actual permanent space. But I think those high cost upfront things can be real barriers to entry. And there's lots of people who have lots of great cooking skills that, that I'm sure lots of people would love to try if they had a place where they could prepare their food. And then even if it's just selling it from a food truck, you know, that's a great place to start. Those food trucks often become permanent businesses. Thank you. Um, we'll wrap up here soon. I've been, we've been talking, we've been asking questions for like 40 minutes now. You guys right. must be really tired. <laughs> um, this is fun. And there's, you know, there's still, there's still a ton of questions here. Um, let's see, where, where should we go here? Where should we go? How about, Ah, here we go. Um, <laughs> this is interesting. Um, do you have any experience? Th this question is asking about specifically about Jersey barriers, which you mentioned throughout the presentation. Um, have you ever seen communities install like art over them or use any al alternatives than Jersey barriers that still, you know, have the same effect, but maybe aren't so Jersey? You know what I mean? Yeah, we've we've definitely seen examples and that it was kind of what we were intending with the cover for the Jersey barrier of where you're taking something that is very infrastructural and mm -hmm. try to give it a little bit more of an art motif. And so we've definitely seen examples of those shells over the Jersey barrier, paint on the Jersey barrier. Um, you can also use barrels filled with sand or water that you're painting. Um, we kind of showed it in some of the images, but didn't go into great detail, but you could use gabion walls, which are low lying cages that you fill with leftover stones that can really be a repurposing of materials in the community and that has that same impact resistive quality. Um, so we have seen some of those examples. Um, some people are building wood fences that obviously doesn't have the impact resistance that might be essential, but you can sort of bookend where you know that the vehicles might have the highest opportunity to hit and you put some of the Jersey barriers there and other materials down the, the long side. So we have seen an implementation of that. And I think that was really the intent with what we were showing is that we're trying to get to something that feels intentional instead of a municipality pulling out Jersey barriers because they needed to cl close off the street during the height of pandemic. How do we make that feel intentional and you know less infrastructural? And this probably depends a lot on the part of the country, but here in New England, there's tons of granite. So there's always an extra, mm -hmm. what I call a granite graveyard where there's mm -hmm. extra pieces of granite curbing and those bugs, those corner pieces that, mm -hmm. that indicate driveways. And granite's pretty strong and it's pretty attractive. So at least around here, you see a lot of use of granite for these purposes. Um, around here, I, I've seen this before. I don't know, I call it like guerrilla marketing kind of, um, where a nonprofit organization will come in for a day and completely like take a street, you know, it's, it's blocked off from traffic. Um, and they sort of design it for pedestrians and it's completely temporary, like for a weekend. Mm -hmm. And then they have some kind of community event. Um, is that a good place to start maybe to help people kind of envision what it could really look like, what, what it could really do? Like, is that, is that a good place to kind of get some backing from, you know, your local elected officials, decision makers, community members? Absolutely. And I think that's really the, the spirit behind the small toolkit is to say, what can we go out and do quickly and, uh, and affordably? to really try to create craft new spaces in the downtown. That could be through cheap paint, chalk, kind of it could be a test run, like you would mock up something in the architectural right. sense. And having partners like nonprofits is a great way to go out and do that because they oftentimes are so deeply engaged with the community that they know who to call upon, who to get feedback from. So that's a great partner mm -hmm. to really have those, you know, a workshop day, if you will, to say, well, let's mark it up with tape or chalk or whatever feels appropriate to say, what do we want this to be like? And that can be part of the visioning and you know, um, process of really figuring out which toolkit we want, what do we want our downtown to be like? Mm -hmm. um, last question, in your case studies, did the communities have like downtown development corporations or, you know, downtown business groups or nonprofits, any, any, anyone dedicated specifically to the downtown, to the main street and its future? Sure. In the six communities, some did and some didn't. So they ranged from having a downtown, basically a business improvement district, so a very well-established, very well-funded 
organization to a much more informal, essentially sort of main streets program. And then some of the communities and often the less affluent community didn't have anything dedicated like that. And it tended to be run out of sort of the mayor's office or the planning and economic development office then, but it obviously didn't have the ability to be quite as focused then. Um, I think those sort of districts are pretty helpful um, if they know, if they have a predictable source of revenue, for example, if if they have a tax income and finance funding that they get every year or a special assessment and they know they have it, then they can launch the type of programming that Shayla was talking about and, and really move the needle over time. If they're always trying to beg for money, they're going to spend 90% of their time begging for money and mm -hmm. not really be able to get much done. Yeah. Um, okay. And I lied. I have one more question. I told <laughs> you I'm never out of questions. <laughs> um, if, if you could briefly touch on, um, in terms of mobility, uh, uh, charging stations, uh, particularly if you're planning on having downtown housing, we have to assume that people are going to have electric vehicles and they're going to want to charge. Or, you know, even if for those folks that are driving, um, they want to get a quick charge in, you know, while they're spending the afternoon mm -hmm. in the downtown. Um, so that, and in terms of other forms of mobility, you know, we're still talking about electric scooters and bikes and things like that. And, um, you know, kind of just providing for them. Sure. I mean, I, I think uh, we, I did a project with a class this fall um, for a downtown district. And one of the recommendations of the group as a way to attract people downtown was basically a charging pod for electric vehicles. They noticed there was a big gap in the EV charging infrastructure in that part of the state. And they said, hey, what if, what if High Street it has an EV charging pod? And you come here, you charge up your vehicle, you walk down the street, you get some food, you, you know, you get some coffee, you add, you know, you spend some money down here while you're waiting, and then your car gets charged and you're on your way. So I think that's a really interesting way of attracting people downtown. Um, obviously, it's not free. Um, so you have to figure out how to pay for it. And then just some a lot of these alternative phones of, of mobility, I think, are really important. I think traditional transit is important. And I think e-bikes are really going to make a big difference for these sort of downtown areas where you maybe it's too far to walk, you don't want to wait for the bus, but you can e-bike in, you don't need to find a parking space, um, and you don't have to get super sweaty. So I'm really excited about that as a new option for, for people in these traditional cities. Absolutely. And then, of course, also, I was then just thinking when we're talking about public restrooms, but also for folks um, who do have bicycles where they have, you know, like the bicycle stations where if you need to, you can take a shower because, you know, you biked in and you're going to work or whatever it is, if you're not living downtown or, you know, just a place for you to keep your bike and tune it up or do whatever you have to do to it. If something happens. Okay. Yeah. Another big piece of the e-bike is going to be, there's going to be a need for more bike lockers because they unfortunately yeah. are very attractive to be stolen. Yep. So right. a traditional lock helps first. If you're just running into a store, you're fine. But if you want to stop for the day downtown and you can't bring right. it into your office, you're going to need something better. Right. Okay. This was great. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff and Shaler, for joining us today and for the Northern New England chapter for hosting today's session. Um, again, we are recording this. We'll post it up onto our YouTube channel. It'll probably pop up sometime on Monday. So be sure to subscribe to our channel. You can um, register for all of our upcoming sessions on our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Uh, and as soon as Shaler and Jeff send me their presentation, now that we know that everyone wants it, we will post it also up on the website along with the link to uh, the recording. Don't forget to log those CM credits. One and a half credits are available for you. And I think that's all I got. So again, Jeff and Shaler, thanks for joining us. Northern New England, thanks for hosting. And we'll talk next time. Thanks, everybody.